and you and got then, this insect farm idea. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I was uh, growing crickets in my apartment and uh, making cricket brownies and stuff. Uh, making, wow. <laughs> making, making everybody trying to eat crickets. The uh, guy across the hall, was uh, he was growing something else in his apartment and making different kind of brownies. <laughs> Well, Did you guys switch? Was there ever was there ever people that were eating your brownies and be like, I don't feel anything? People are like, Oh, I want different brownies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this so, doesn't seem to be doing anything for me. It's like one of the most things that people, most common things that people say. Like, I wish, I you wish know what else different. you could put in those brownies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's so. call it. That's college life for you. You gotta have you gotta have those people that make it colorful. All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. Get your greens edition. Today we're going to pull some teats and grow some leeks. Do you, I wrote that myself, isn't that? Oh, that's for just For those amazing. of you that don't know what a leek is, it's, I've never, I don't think that I've ever had them, but they're some kind of a vegetable of some kind. That, oh, I thought you were going to talk, you know, say like a nipple leek, like at a hog bar. No, a leek. Oh, like, it's okay. like a, I don't know, it's something that people put in fancy dishes that I don't ever eat, but mm. anyway. Anyway, I digress. We've got a monster TikToker on here today with a very diversified background. And uh, before we get into that, though, we're going to ask you to pay the fee. So um, we don't really advertise much on here other than our fancy merchandise. So, if, you know, spring's coming, so it's time for a wardrobe change. So you're probably going to need a T-shirt or whatever. And so buy some merch, support the channel. Share it out with your friends, family, coworkers if you guys get any value. That's the, the fee. It's a kind of exchange of uh value so like if you guys get anything share it out and that's all we ask from you and leave a review spotify apple anything helps us we're trying to grow this thing apparently i wasn't doing a good enough job well the intro i don't think you were <laughs> i don't think you were explaining the fee all the way you just share the show guys that's what helps us that's what the fee is for you Usually Sawyer does the intro, and uh, he wanted me to do the intro. But then, as soon as I start talking, I could see him be like, "Hey, that's not how you do that." I'm gonna. It'd be the same. It's well. Here's the other thing. Dad always introduces the guest, so it's gonna be flipped, and it's flipped today. So he'll probably look at me the same way I just looked at him, and he'll probably just go mumble something under under his breath. I'll just turn my back so that when I uh, cross my arms in disgust, you don't see it. Yeah. Okay. So, Usually it, that's not the case. I do see it. So, but yeah, no, it's, it's a little different today. We're going to try We're going to try to make this concise, concise. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, this guy is really interesting. I think you guys will get a lot of value out of it and the markets. There's no use talking about the markets because the quantity markets, they just keep, uh, keep on trucking. And so no market update today. We'll get back to that next time. Uh, if there's a change, so we're going to forgo all that. Today we are joined by a famous TikToker you might know with 1.9 million followers to be exact. A farm grit kid who immigrated from the Netherlands with his family to the great state of Iowa to start a dairy farm. He also has built a brand around his passion for dairy farming by sharing great content and educating millions on agriculture. He also is the head of production of a company called Nebulum. Nailed it. Nice I was job. really afraid I was going to just not get that company name right, but now I, I, I got him, it. I owe him five bucks because yep. I bet him that you'd yep. screw it up. Yep, pay up. An indoor produce farm delivering fresh produce to the great communities of Iowa. It is our pleasure to welcome Huey Be Cool. Huey, welcome to Barn Talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> pleasure to be here. Thanks for taking the time and coming down. And, and you're from, you live in Ames or do you live in Brooklyn? Uh, I live in Ames currently. Live in, live in Ames. So it's about a two hour drive. Yep. Awfully windy today. Well, it's a little shorter coming this way. Yeah. It'll be a little slower probably got going a, back. Probably got a forearm pump because he had to probably do this the whole time because I mean, it, it's pretty windy out today. You got about a 40 mile an hour tailwind. Yeah. Spring wouldn't be so bad if the wind wasn't, too, you know, just terrible. It, you know, the, the weather tends to be all right. 50 degrees, I can do that. But when you get 40 mile an hour winds, I mean, it just doesn't no. doesn't cut the cheddar. It, it's terrible because last weekend we had beautiful. It was 70 degrees, 
Beautiful weather. Perfect. Took the top off the Jeep, took the doors off, except for uh, Trisha's door. She didn't want her door off because she was afraid that I was going to like shove her. Barrel roll. It looked a little weird. It looked, yeah, that's true. It looked a little weird because the back doors were off, but the front doors were on. Yeah, I was going to, I did look at it and I was a little. But hey, you got to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do for the wife. And then, then it turned and it's been crap ever since. Yep. That happens every spring. The Summer's is, coming though. It gets, I get soft. It makes yeah. you soft. Yeah. Summer's coming, though. It'll be nice and hot. And anyway. You can have your shirt off and show all the, yeah. show your amazing physique to everybody. Welcome to the gun show. Yeah. All right, Huey, let's give a little bit of background. Enough about our rambling and our <laughs> dumb, dumb, I don't know what you call it, commentary. What do you call it? Commentary. Commentary, yeah. Uh, let's get a little background. Uh, let's start with the story of you guys leaving the Netherlands to come to the state. Where do so, you want to start? Yeah, where do you want to start? <laughs> so, yeah, give us the background because it's a pretty interesting uh, journey that you you and your family took to get over here. Um, interesting and quick and long journey at the same time. Right. Um, so in uh, the the fall of 2008, we actually came over. The, so I'm a, a sibling out of five, and we have so seven in our family. And the five of us <clears throat> came over to three oldest. I'm the middle, and that, so two above, two underneath me. And uh, we came over in the fall of 2008 to visit Iowa and Iowa Farms and uh, Dutch dairy farmers in Iowa. Yep. And um, so we visited farms and we're like, okay, so, you know, how's it going over here? What, what do you guys think? What, what's it like? And um, people are like, well, it's, you know, we like it. And, you know, we got a really good impression and um, kind of sh- showed around and, you know, showed the good parts of it, of course. Right. You know, God's country. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, wow, people are, <clears throat> people are really nice here and um, kind of down to earth people. And yeah. Uh, that's one of the reasons we picked Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, yep. Iowa. There's very good people. It's a very good community. Um, so, and there was a, a dairy farm there that was uh, not doing so well at the time. So the the dairy farm that we bought, there, we bought a, an existing dairy farm. Mm-hmm. It had capacity for about 400 cows. Um, there was about 250 at the time. Um, not doing well. Not doing well. And uh, so took over the farm. Uh, immediate in, uh, we bought the farm in, so we visited in the fall and we were like, okay, you know, do we want to do this? So we pulled and say, yeah, yep. We want to do this and uh, pulled the trigger because our parents, they basically asked us the three oldest kids, like, you know, if you're going to, you're going to, you are going to live here for the most of your life right yep, now. Right. So like, this isn't just our thing. This right, is a yeah. family thing. <clears throat> yeah. So they kind of brought us into it. And of course we're like, Hell yeah. Sure. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, so, yep. And then uh, we decided, okay, so let's go ahead with it. And um, bought that farm in uh, June of 2009. So June of 2009, uh, my my dad went over with my brother and grandpa for about a month. And then um, just to, because we took ownership of it in June 1st, and then just to kind of set things up and get started. And then um, he came back. Uh, we, they all came back for, uh, we had our, it was a, the day Michael Jackson died. Oh, okay. he <laughs> wow. came back. He was, cause he was in the airport and it was just like, you know, everywhere breaking news, you know, just the whole world shocked. And, um, it was the day that he was coming back from, from the farm and to, cause we had our going away party Yep. and going away party. And, um, you know, we had everything packed up and, and containers and basically just, Sold a, sold a bunch of our equipment, sold cows, um, sold equipment for a couple months, basically. Just got rid of all the stuff that so you, you couldn't take with you. Yeah, so you sold, so you grew up on a dairy farm in the Netherlands. And when you made this decision, you sold out. Yeah, besides all the stuff you could take with you, though, obviously. Yeah, run so it, we, help run it. we took, um, we took, we actually have a lot of equipment from the Netherlands because it's a lot cheaper to buy stuff over there and ship it over here. Yep. It's just like thousands and tens of thousands of dollars a difference. Mm. Um, like you can't even justify it buying it here. And uh, the service lacks a lot of times. We've yeah. had uh, mechanics from the Netherlands fly over to come fix wow. stuff. Like service is top notch. Maybe we and should get, get that guy's car. <laughs> yeah, be a good idea. <laughs> well, it was, um, <clears throat> it was for, uh, we had, a, uh, you, know, you guys know Bacon, the feed wagons. They're, mm-hmm. uh, it's P-E-E-C-O-N. And uh, we had one of those. 
it was from that one was actually I think they had one sitting in California or something like that. So, but anyways, they had it shipped over the farm, and it's it was too tall for our John Deere loader because <laughs> yep. those things are they weigh like forty five tons when they're empty. Wow, like, you know, heavy machines and super tall. You couldn't so, fill it. No, nope. so then we needed a special bucket. It was a, a high tilt bucket, and this company that we worked with in the Netherlands they'd never made one of those before. And uh, they made one specially for us, and then something went wrong, so they flew out a mechanic to fix it, and he was he spent like a week with us on the farm. That's um, pretty cool. So, anyways, long yeah. tangent. So we got um, everything moved over. Like we had, I think uh, two or three maybe shipping containers full of stuff. Um, like a 1970s Volvo tractor came over <laughs> as well, um, but just a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. Um, yeah, I went to went to high school and yeah. What age were you when you 12. did make 12? 12, 12 when I moved over. You got so you pretty much got to live. You got to remember what the Netherlands was like, and then you come over and you're like going into the teenager stage, and then you yeah. got to re. It was it kind of a culture shock at first, or was it? It was pretty easy to adapt at first. At, at first, yeah, it was for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so you know, spent so July. Uh, July 3rd, we got, we actually, that was landing day for me. It was July, okay. July 3rd, 2009. That's my, my anniversary. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually last Two days year, of celebrating then. Yeah. <laughs> so last year um, was actually the 12 year anniversary. So now I've lived here longer than I've lived over there. Yeah. Which I'm pretty proud of. Um, so July 3rd was a landing day and, you know, you go to school like, August or something, yeah, right. you know, third week of August. And, uh, so the, that, that little bit of time <clears throat> just spent on the farm speaking Dutch yep. mm-hmm. because Dutch, I grew up with Dutch. Yeah. English is my second language. And, uh, just, so just grew up speaking Dutch and just didn't, I didn't really want to speak Dutch or I didn't really, really want to speak English. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, just cause I didn't really know. Right. Didn't right. Really know how. Yeah. Why would you? And I was like, um, I had a couple classes over there, um, like you, they start English pretty young, but it was it was basic basic mm-hmm. stuff. So I like I had the the, the like the footing, yep. as mm-hmm. you would say, for English, uh, but just the very basics. And then um, we were over here for a little bit in school. And in, in school, I didn't really want to speak English; only wanted to read Dutch books. So it was it was tough for like the first couple of weeks. Um, and then we had to go back to the Netherlands for a brief stint. And then I had uh, some trouble getting back, so we had to go back to the Netherlands for longer. And then coming back from that stint, uh, I just remember it English just like clicking. I guess like it for for some reason. Like I don't remember <clears throat> being like, "Oh, okay, this week I know these words and this word," and just kind of happened. It just just clicked. Mm. Yeah, which is interesting. I don't know how that happens. I think it's just because I was just just immersed into it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, just go speak English. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. It was weird. So why did you guys want to leave the Netherlands? What, what made you guys want to move to the States? Was there any particular reason? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, the Netherlands, uh, they're like in, in Europe and the the Netherlands a lot more than other countries in Europe. Uh, but they have been trying to push out farmers, um, because of emissions, so like mm. fertilizer use, uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, nitrogen and methane and stuff. Yep, cow farts. Uh, yep. <laughs> so they have been paying farmers to buy their land and basically just buy them out. Mm. And uh, so our our land right now is like a fi- is a fish trap. Really. So it's just it's it's a nature. Because like you were nature. You guys went back and visited and saw. Yeah, yeah. Does it did does you, it anger? Did you, does that did you throw a your, match? Like your <laughs> your dad and your grandpa? Does that? How do they feel about that? So my uh, well, my grandpa always had the saying, you know, you that's called making making bad land from good land. Yep. <laughs> um, but uh, he's I actually have I don't have much memory of him. Uh, yeah, he passed, passed away, away in ninety nine. Oh, okay. So mm-hmm. when I was like three, uh, so I don't have too many memories of him, uh, but. I'm sure he I'm sure would he not would approve. Not like it. Yeah. Mm-mm. No. Um, yeah. Uh, but, and uh, yeah, my dad, I mean, my dad's focused on 
farm, over what's here, here farming now. Farming here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you um, kind of, so you guys kind of saw the handwriting on the wall and thought, if we're going to be in the dairy business long term, it's not going to be here. We, um, it's basically in the United States, you have you have way more room. Obviously, yeah. you have more room to expand, and yeah. and you know we we saw we saw some some opportunity with the farm that was already there. You know, it was on a hill. There was more room to build on the hill. Yeah. And now now the hill's pretty much maxed out. When you first came over to visit and you come to Iowa, um, you know, what what did you think about just the scale, like just the size when you're driving around? Because a lot, I think a lot of people don't realize it's huge. People think about Europe and they look about they they hear all these countries and when they think of a country they think they're all f- pretty good size but I don't think people grasp how how small things are how tight things are yeah. and you know going from where you were and the size of your fields and and how close you were to neighbors and all that when you came over here what'd you think massive massive fields <laughs> yeah I mean <clears throat> the big one of the biggest fields that like left like a really big impression on me as a childhood, like driving by to get some hay uh, with my dad, like with, with a tractor and stuff. So uh, over like a dike, like looking down upon this field, just I thought it was just massive, massive field. Um, I think it's like maybe five acres. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's yeah. like 10, maybe 10 yeah. acres, or 10 or five or 10 acres or something. Right. And I just thought that was the most, just a massive, just a giant field. Um, but yeah, it's it's crazy the scale of yeah. how big Iowa is and how many millions of like it's crazy how many how many miles it's there a is. it's a total a lot of farm acres yeah a yeah lot it's of just farm. a sh- it's just a shift when you you know when you come here when you're not used to that mm-hmm. and we take so much for granted mm-hmm. the space we have and you know the other thing is the regulation you know we we feel like today we've got more regulation than we've ever had but we don't really know what regulation is compared no. to most of the world. Do you feel like that's kind of picking up here? Do you feel like it's going to happen here? Um, or like, you know, what are your parents? I mean, you said they're pretty focused on farming, but do they kind of keep an eye on like, okay, if things start looking like they did back in the Netherlands, is that trying to, is that kind of creeping up in America, you think? No, I don't, I don't think so as much here. To get a manure permit, you go to the local county. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. You have the lady that complains about the gravel roads being too dusty. Like that's the <laughs> right. only thing. Right. Right. Like, right. You know, and it's like, okay, ready to go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's fine. Um, but it's 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 super easy here to expand. It seems like it's good. It's right. Good for, it's good for business. Right. Yep. Um, I definitely encourage that and stuff. Um, yeah, the Netherlands, like for example. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of regulations over there and, uh, government has a huge, huge play in dairy farmers, just in farmers daily lives. Yep. Um, so for example, a couple years ago, the government put out something, it was a, a, a plan to cut down on emissions and they said, turn in 10% of your herd. So wow. Call 10% of your herd. Hmm. How the heck does that work? Didn't care. Just said, yep, you got to follow your, instructions. So cut your income by 10% too. See how well, you cut, cut. Your, cut your income by more than that. If you're cutting your yeah. herd by 10%. And it was, um, so people had to sell off just basically at market rates, whatever that was at the time. Um, I think it was, it was a couple of years ago and they just had something. I saw it a couple months ago again, where they were trying to do something again. So, Another ten percent. What do you always say about government, Dad? When they try to regulate things, give, they don't really. They don't a, see that it hurts no, the end consumer. Give them yeah. a thumb, take an arm. Well, yeah. the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I mean, that's government. You know, they react to one. They Touch. they have one issue that they react to, and they want to fix that issue. But the problem is that they don't understand that what they're dealing with is like an ecosystem. And it all, it all trickles down. If you're, if you're messing with, if you're messing with the economics of producing any product, the ultimate loser in that is the person that has to buy the finished product. And, and we're seeing that. I mean, you're seeing it. And every, and we talked about everything, you know, we talked about prop 12 and, you know, you, you put more regulations on something that makes that product cost more. Who's that hurt? 
it hurts the person that's buying that product that can least afford the product because mm-hmm. it's always a consumer. Yeah, that it is. Every, and every scenario it works out. It's yeah. Just, it's just, yeah. And it doesn't change. You know, mm-hmm. every, every group of politicians as they come up, they think, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to get it right this time. You know, however many times we tried it before and it didn't work, well, we're going to get it this time. And it doesn't. It never changes because at the end of the day, it's basic economics. And mm-hmm. is, that just, <clears throat> is that just people trying to do good, but they, they have genuinely a lack of understanding of economics? Yes. I think, or definitely. is that people trying to be bad actors? Oh, well, I think that's a little bit of both. There's both. For sure. We went to, we went to see Jordan Peterson uh, mm-hmm. in Cedar Rapids here what just a few days ago yeah, we saw dan the man yeah. iowa dairy farmer shout out to iowa dairy farmer yeah. we got a bite to eat right before the show and he was in there with jamie and they were eating a bite and yeah then we tried to leave because we just assumed that he picked up our ticket <laughs> and they, they got kind of pissy with us and they're like i'm like what dishes. didn't dan i thought dan got that because these dairy farmers they got all kinds of money yeah so i figured i was like what do you mean he didn't pay that's anyway, something, that's something you <laughs> must have been say. an oversight on his fault on his part. Jordan Peterson is a lot to try to. You have to for me. You have to take his stuff very intelligent in, in very small bites. But yeah, one of his points was that you know, government communism is a great example. It's been tried so many times, and the idea, the basic idea, is a good idea. People that are deeply caring. They don't want there to be people left out. They want everybody to have a place at the table. They want they want everybody to be the same, same level. <laughs> the problem is they don't want no suffering. They want no right. You know, bottom class. They want it right. to be. I mean, that's the fun. That's the fundamental uh, thing of economics, right? You you can only have if it's it's only a net gain if nobody is worse off. Right. Right. The problem they get into is you cannot legislate productivity in people and there's always people that it's i you know i always equate this back to pigs and we could go off on a long ways but it's no different than than i mean it is i'm oversimplifying it but it's no different than pigs you know we get pigs and they're all the same they're all the same genetics and they're basically all the same age and we give put them in the nicest building we can and we feed them all the same diet and we do everything the same and guess what happens 10 percent of them do better than all the rest 10% 10% do poorer than all the rest. 5% of them don't even make it. They end up dying for whatever reason. And the rest of them are all somewhere in between. And you can't, you scratch your head and you're like, well, why is this, why is it like this? Because, you know, it's, they're all, you know, it should, they should all be like right here. They're not. And people are even more so. Within any system you give them, there's people that are going to overachieve because they're going to stay up late and they're going to figure out a way to work that system or they're going to put in an extra hour or they're going to work an extra day or they're going to do whatever. And then there's people that are going to figure out, well, I can do nothing. Collect a check. And I'm still going to get taken care of. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to do nothing. And you cannot legislate that. You cannot fix that. You cannot fix that. That is human nature. And we, we have... Forever we will have people that, for whatever reason, they are more productive, than, more productive than everybody else, and we'll have a group that is less productive than everybody else. And I just don't know. It, the Capitalism, to me, is the best, the best way to try to navigate that in the fact that the people that are most productive create more wealth that goes to everybody, and everybody's cost goes down because of the efficiency. But well, government, yeah, and human. I mean, it involves civilization. Think about all. If you didn't incentivize, if Elon Musk wasn't incentivized by making more money, he wouldn't be able to do amazing things. Right. Or you know, name anybody. Bill Gates. Right. We don't really like Bill Gates, but Microsoft would have never came out. Steve Jobs would have never came out with Apple if there right. was no money. Right. He couldn't make money and do it. You know. It. But the other side of that is, then you have people in government that realize, and those are the bad actors. The bad actors realize. That if we make people that are independent minded, that want to make their own way in the world, that are dependent on no one, it's very hard to control them. Yep. And we like to have control. So we like people that want to get a check in the mail. We like people that are dependent upon us because they'll vote our way. And that is a bad actor. And the world is full of those people. And our future, 
We every I don't know how many times we said that every civilization's ever been on this planet thinks they're the smartest son of a bitches on the face of the earth. We all do. We think, man, America. You get all these politicians. Joe Biden just said it the other day. You know, we're America. You know, by God, we're you know we're whatever. Well, what we're really we're smarter than everybody. We got this figured out. We can print money to kingdom come. We can we can be soft on everything, and we're gonna be all right. Well, guess what? You're not going to be any better than the Romans, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Aztecs. The what? You can go back whatever you want. Every one of them civilizations thought they were smarter than the last one, and they all screwed up. They all screwed up, and we're not above that. Anyway, we'll have to edit that down because I talked too much. You went on a little tangent there. About the long, I did. It's about the long term. Long yeah, term that's game, right. right. Yeah. That's right. But anyway, well, you, know. <laughs> you found yourself in Brooklyn, Iowa. <laughs> And you learned English. Thank the good Lord for that. Were you happy that you moved? Are you ultimately happy with the decision of coming to America? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No regrets. No. Good. No, No, not at all. Um, It's America is, is, I think, one of the best places to be. Even after your rant there, Dad, it's still one of the best places. (laughs) Well, it's like (laughs) there are certain things that you want in life. And there are certain steps that you have to take to get to what you want in life. Right. And if you're taking those steps, then and you realize that you're on a journey of taking a bunch of steps, right? You're gonna then that's you're, then America is a good place to be. If you don't have a goal, if you don't have ambition, America is not a good place to be. Right. <laughs> um, right. That's true. Yeah. So no, I think I think it's it's a good place to be for sure. Good. Well, that's yeah. good. We're glad we're glad that you're here. Uh, <laughs> I heard you have a very complicated Dutch birth name. Uh, that's really hard to pronounce. That's so why we did. could we could we hear your birth name and then tell us why you're you're you go by Huey? So my name is Gerardus Hendrikus Johannes Maria Bullen. God, that's oh, badass. Okay, that's like John Wick shit. That is <laughs> walk into a. <laughs> you could be an assassin with that name <laughs> for sure. So is that a family? Is that like a family name? So um, a lot of people in the Netherlands will have multiple birth names. Right. So um, you're like on your birth certificate or whatever on your passport, it'll say all those names. And then you have a calling name. So so it gets even more complicated. So my calling name <clears throat> is Geert, which is G-E-E-R-T, G-E-E-R-T. And um, that's that's basically what I've like heard my entire, like that's what I just get called my entire right, that's life. That's your, um, yeah. Calling name literally. Um, so yeah. And, um, so there's two, like there's the birth names, the calling names. And then, um, Huey came out of, um, when I first moved here, um, it was in PE class and, uh, there's, um, we, well, everybody lined up and like, Oh, I'm, whatever, I'm, I'm Kat, and, you know, and then the next person next to me, oh, I'm Tommy or whatever. And it's like, oh, well, how, wait, how do you say your name? Wait, what? And everybody just, you know, I said Kat, and everybody just pauses. Cause they're like, yeah, uh, I don't know if I'll I can say that. I'll never be able to repeat that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, so she's like, oh, you, there's this uh, uh, girl in my class, and she's like, oh, you need a nickname. Uh, how about Huey? I said, all right. Sounds, Sounds good. good. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's, yeah. let's go with it. Yep. And then uh, people started to uh, kind of, as I got you know more known throughout the high school, and you know people started to kind of know how to say my name. They actually started to try to say my name. Uh, most people still butchered it. It's like Hia and Gert and uh, yep. yo- yogurt. And you're just like you know what? Just call me Huey. Yeah, just call me. Yeah. Just call me Huey. No, so then uh, I went to community college. And I uh, ran cross country and track at uh, Southwestern Community College in sure. Cre- in Creston, uh, basically straight west here, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, and um, first first day of practice, uh, everybody like introduced themselves and hit, and someone's like, "Oh, never gonna be able to say that. You need a nickname." <sighs> and then uh, just another a teammate of mine's like. How about Huey? I was like, <laughs> Sounds familiar. Right. You Sounds didn't even good. tell them before that that was your nickname. They nope. just came up with that. Yep. That's so awesome. That, so two two people randomly came up with it, and two just totally ra- random times in my life. And <laughs> that's when you were no, you just knew yeah. this is the so name like, for me. I'll stick with it. Yep. And so you went to community college, and 
I th- you went to Iowa State too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your college journey and what degree you got and all that stuff. Well, sounds, what made you decide good. that that's what you wanted to do? Yeah. That you even wanted to go to college? Like, was it an option that did they say you could just all right, you just want to work on the dairy farm, or were you did your parents be like, uh, eh, you probably better go do something else? No. So I um <clears throat> I first just talking to uh, the vets that came out at the dairy farm. You know, where'd, where'd you go to school? Iowa State. Where'd you go to school? Iowa State. Where'd you, Iowa State. Like, okay, all right. So, and then I, I originally wanted to be a vet. Um, and then took a couple anatomy classes and realized. <laughs> Thank oh, God you didn't do that. Boy, this is a lot to remember. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> oh, man. And hey. uh, I, I just wasn't ready for that, for that schooling. Do you know what the difference between a uh, chiropractor and a uh, veterinarian is? A uh, couple hundred thousand dollars and some years of school. Chiropractor's a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, you're going to get destroyed. Shout out, to, oh. shout out to you, Ethan Spronk. <laughs> so <laughs> so one, of the, one of the former vets for the company I used to work for, he came to work for them right out of, right out of college, right out of vet school. <laughs> and it was during a part where the company was kind of growing. So they didn't have enough offices. They were building a new office building. And so three of us all got hired at the same time. And we all got put in this like conference room and that was our office. And anyway, I, I just would bug him unmercifully uh, about being a vet. And I think that was like the first, first or second day that we were together. I'm like, Hey, Spronk, you know what the difference between, (laughs) between a chiropractor and a vet is? And he just looked at me and I could tell he was like, yep. Not going to be friends with him. <laughs> but we turned out to be good friends, so shout out to you, Spronky. Yeah, I was going to say, you got some explaining to do after telling that. That's good. They're, they're good for it. They paid enough for that. They paid enough for those uh, those letters behind their name, so mm-hmm. it's it's all in fun. Yeah, could, go ahead and continue. <laughs> so, um, just I realized I didn't want to really go on the veterinarian path anymore. Uh, still, I liked, um, but then I wanted to become a... Uh, commodity guy, yeah. commodity trader of some sorts. Um, I knew I liked ag and I knew I liked money, <laughs> right? <laughs> Business. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to, uh, and then at first, uh, I was, um, I probably thought I was better than I actually was at like track and stuff. Um, so I got a scholarship, <clears throat> got a scholarship to run at community college. Um, so that's, I basically just went where the money was. Right. Um, so distance was, or sprint or uh, distance. Okay. Yeah. Well, yep. in my senior year, I did. Uh, I was went to state for the four hundred. There you go. Four hundred, the mile, and the two mile. You look like you got a long stride. <laughs> yeah. You probably could. Yeah. So, um, so went to um, community college for a year. I did. I took some classes in high school, some college classes in high school. So I took, I racked up like 26 credits. I uh, just took full advantage of the opportunity to take, take some yeah. credits in high school. Um, cause that gave me a chance to, uh, com- graduate community college in a year. Uh, again, when I was at community college, I just racked up all the credits. I'm like, I'm just going to get out of here in a year. You know, I, I actually, the reason being because I, signed my letter of intent which i actually found the other day i actually didn't sign it i only took the picture and pretend to sign it so it's not signed but um i signed my letter of intent with a different coach than i actually ran ended up running with um, and this, this one coach that i signed with um i was told you know this great coach amazing coach just the best person ever signed with him and he leaves like in between when i signed and when i was going to join the team other guy comes in huge not. disaster and um i did not enjoy running anymore at all um so then i was like you know basically i i tried to set myself up so that if i wanted to i could do two years of or a year and a half of community college yeah so i could run a second season if i liked it yeah but then mid-season i'm like no nope, i'm not doing this i'm loading up on credits second semester so i can get out of here so I graduated um, after doing a little bit of track too, and then uh, went on to Iowa State in fall of 2016, and um, that's when I started. I started in ag business, and then I um, let's see, in the spring, 
No, let's see. Yeah, spring of 2018, I uh, took a semester off to travel. I uh, spent about 10 weeks in Hawaii on the big island of Hawaii uh, working on a permaculture farm. So th- this farm um, was growing about 200 different fruits, vegetables, uh, mac nuts, papayas, bananas, at like lemons, oranges, limes, every like everything you could possibly think, think of. of. Um, coconuts, pineapples. Yeah, it was <clears throat> it was amazing. And then uh, went uh, visited Australia and visited a an insect farmer there, which I was already um, heavily involved in uh, researching insect farming at that time. It was like 2017, uh, fall of 2017. Uh, I was in an entrepreneurship class, had to come up with a couple business concepts <clears throat> and. Um, one of the one of the three business concepts that I came up with was insect farming, and after listening to a podcast about it about cricket farming, yep. and um, I was like, okay, that's that sounds interesting. So I uh, went ahead with that in the class, and um, I I won like a, a pitch for it, won like a hundred bucks for it or something. I'm like, I might right, got so, something here. Yeah, I might may, have something. Maybe maybe um, didn't didn't end up win, winning like the big 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 prize in right. the class or whatever, but. Anyways, whatever, uh, kept that idea, just kind of sat on it for a while. Um, so traveled for three months, uh, went to <clears throat> Hawaii, Australia, China, which China, crazy place. Yep. <laughs> just crazy place. Uh, and I was only there for about a, about a week. Least but, favorite place out of those three? Yes, China. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was interesting. <laughs> One of the days we couldn't go outside because the air was too bad. In Be- oh, jeez. In, in Beijing. Oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Beijing there was a couple, uh, couple like trillion dollars worth of industry around. Like, um, I think they a lot of the, a lot of the smog comes from their coal. Yeah. Bur- that they burn. Coal out power there. plants. Yep, and. Um, one of the days that the air got so bad that they so what they do is still just government will just come in and say, hey, air is too bad, you know, shut it down. And they'll just shut everything down, wait for everything to clear out, and then fire everything back up again. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I had a, a crazy. guy when I was in the, when I was selling um, an equipment company that we worked with, there was a guy that worked for them, and he lived in China for 10 years. Him and his wife moved over there. And, you know, when he comes to the show, everybody asks, you know, what's that like? What's that like? And we were sitting one night having drinks, and he said, I pretty much got it down that when people ask me that, I just tell them, I tell them, you know how when you go to the, when you go like for a walk in the timber, and you're walking in the timber, and there's all these trees, but it's Iowa, and you know that if you just walk one direction far enough, you're just going to walk out of the trees, and then there aren't going to be any. He goes, in China, when you're walking and there's all those people, he goes, you could walk, you could walk for days and you'll never, you'll never run out of people. He goes, that's what it's like. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty powerful. There's so many people there. Yeah. yeah. And like Beijing, like, you know, they're like a small city of, for example, COVID, small city of Wuhan. It's got like, I think it has like 12 million people yeah. or something. Like, yeah, it's a massive, massive city. Yeah. That's, it's that's crazy. Just, that's small. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really it was interesting being over there, and um, I had to talk to. So my I went with my sister to. So I went the first ten weeks I spent in Hawaii uh, by myself, and then my sister joined for like last last week in Hawaii, and then for all the other trips uh, we met uh, her old track teammate that she ran with in college in Australia, and then another classmate in China, and then went back to the Netherlands to visit our family. Um, but then when we were in China, we were, I was, we were basically talking through this translator app or whatever the whole time. So yeah, it was interesting. Um, first thing I did there was actually go get a mask, (laughs) (laughs) which is, which is really funny. Uh, the first thing I went and I just got the, the N95 mask or whatever. And this is in 2018 before. Yeah. I was going to say a good thing you went even a thing. Good thing you went to these places Um, when you did. Yeah. And not like, now. Like, um, we, it was basically like, you know, your, your, your mouth would just get dry 
just walking from around the air. if you didn't have a mask on. Like you, in in the there's a car just parked across the hotel, and you could see it parked there at the beginning of the day. At the end of the day, you could run your finger along it, and it just your black. finger would just be black. So, <laughs> just, oh, gosh. like everything is Couldn't just pay me. gray, and could not pay damn. me enough money. To live in one of those yeah. places. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Made you never want to live in a city. Yeah, that for sure. Yeah, just like the quality of air. Yeah, oh, it's not good. Yeah, it's not. That's an, that's another nice thing about Iowa. Um, like I was I was on the dairy farm during the pandemic when that really took off or whatever, and it was like, well, you know, the population density here is like three people per square mile or right. something. So like <laughs> right. this is statistically the best place in the world. To I be. could possibly yep. be. Yep. You know, it's like, you're, you're not going to run into anybody. So you come back from that. And so what did you, what was your takeaway? Like, did that kind of change your trajectory of what you thought you wanted to do or what you wanted to explore? Um, yeah. So I, I was really into uh, entrepreneurship um, really because of that, that one class, that class really expired yep. me uh, by Kevin Kimley and Dave Krog at Iowa state. Um, that really, really inspired me to just, just look at the world differently. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, they, they laid things out like, you know, there's going to be an extra billion people out of Africa in the next so many years. And there's going to be this much more food needed here. And it was like, Oh shit. Like, mm-hmm. and, and the, a lot of opportunity, the professor that, uh, Kim Lee given him uh, some credit too. He, he basically looked, said he was in this class. He's like, you know, the the way the the way that I felt is like you guys could be the next it's your generation that, that can solve these issues. Right. Like here's the stats. You guys got to fix Go. it. <laughs> you know, basically. Right. Uh, which it's not it's not like it was like a oh you need to do this. You know, there's pressure on right. you. Whatever. It was just like a motivator. I felt like it was kind of a nudge. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that was that was cool. So I I added a minor of entrepreneurship as well. So ag biz and entrepreneurship. Yep. Um, and you and got then, this insect farm idea. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I was, uh, growing crickets in my apartment and, uh, making cricket brownies and stuff. Uh, making, wow. Making, <laughs> making everybody trying to eat crickets. The uh, guy across the hall was, uh, he was growing something else in his apartment and making different kind of brownies. <laughs> Well, Did you guys switch? <laughs> was there ever was there ever people that were eating your brownies and be like, I don't feel anything? People are like, Oh, I want different brownies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. this so, doesn't uh, seem to be doing anything for me. <laughs> it's like one of the most things that people most common things that people say. Like, I wish, I you wish know what else different. you could put in those brownies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's so, call it. That's college life for you. You gotta have you gotta have those people that make it colorful. Yeah, it's funny. My my roommate, uh, my one of my roommates too. He. He woke up with a couple of crickets in his pillow one day, and <laughs> oh man, yeah, like I had a tent and it wasn't completely it had a hole in it, <clears throat> and yeah. things got out. And you know, when you get when you get crickets to raise, depending on what size you get them, they can be like, you know, as big as a pinhead, right? As big as a they can a get pen. through. Um, so, you know, yeah, they can get through anything almost. Um, little bastards, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So Great starting crickets. this cricket deal yeah same time you're going to school where does it all where does it all go where do you end up so um 2018 uh there's this program at iowa state called uh, the startup factory it's it basically brings uh startups that you know it gives them a network to talk to investors and gives them a little bit of um gives them a little bit of education advice on business and uh basically how to run a business, how to start a business, how to raise money, all that stuff. Um, so <clears throat> after coming back from Hawaii, the com- I uh, was working on the company and then uh, we joined that program. And then uh, through the summer, <clears throat> um, let's see. Yeah, through this, I can't remember if it was the fall. I think it was fall of 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're in that program and uh, that's it's a year long program, basically get free office space, which is cool. So also raising crickets in there. And then, uh, we started to, you know, basically, so the industry is super young yet. Uh, it's a, there is like a dozen companies, maybe 20. There's probably more than 20 now that I, I don't know about, but I'd say 20 prominent companies that are in the space right now. <clears throat> and when I first heard about it in 2016, um, which when I heard when I when I really started listening to podcasts was in 2016, 
and um, now I mostly listen to podcasts. But I started listening to podcasts, and I heard uh, how stuff works, howstuffworks dot com, uh, cricket farming. And then in that episode, they were like, "Oh, there's about a dozen players in the industry, and you know, it could be the potential, the potential future of you know another alternative protein source, mm -hmm. um, or you know, that could be that's where the future could go." And I'm like, "Well, anything that only has a dozen companies in it and could be an alter alternative way to feed people sustainably." It's huge opportunity crazy like i have to look into this um so looked into it and then the class and then formed a company started it and then uh, went to a couple different uh conferences like insect eating insect eating conference it's crazy had like uh, a dozen insects uh, like spiders wasps ants crickets uh bamboo worms like all, uh, grasshoppers you name it i've I've had a lot of different scorpions. scorpions. What's your favorite insect to eat? What was the tastiest? Uh, scorpion tastes a lot like bacon. Oh, like, like, wow! Like very crunchy bacon. Yeah. Huh. Like, like if you, like if you didn't have any, uh, say you just just eat it. Just don't even just close your eyes. Eat it once, and then don't even think about that. It's a scorpion. I bet you'd like it. <laughs> I bet you'd like it, and then just like throw it on your salad. Cause so, do you flavor it? Do you like cook it and then like flavor it? And like smoke it or like how do you I think I think these were so uh one of the common ways is to just so whenever you the the way to farm so farming insects, uh so crickets for example, you could start off it's pretty simple. They can just be grain fed, um, just like a chicken feed diet. That's what a lot of uh cricket farmers, commercial cricket farmers will feed them, just a chicken feed diet. Um, because it's it's very it's already a, a solution. It's already formulated. It's, it's already formulated. It's already, it's perfectly dialed in. Um, and then there's also, there's actually specialized cricket feed, um, but basically just a water source, some feed, and then a place for them to hang out on, which is a lot of times egg cartons because they like hanging out on egg cartons for some reason. Mm. Um, and then uh, some soil for them to breed in the last like two or three weeks of their life, lifespan. So crickets, they only live eight to 10 weeks. And from egg, from hatch to harvest, is seven weeks. Okay. So it's it's a super quick turn and, turnover. Yeah. yeah. And um, every uh, each female cricket lays about a hundred, hundred to two hundred eggs. Hmm. So if you raise them right, if you do your eggs right, you can multiply, multiply. like exponentially. So how? Do, but how does that work? So you would. When basically when they lay their eggs, then that's the time that you want to harvest them before the next generation is hatched. So there's like a there's a, a, a window whenever they start chirping basically. That's when they're ready to ready to mate. So at that time you put out your put out your soil for the crickets and then there's a there's like a seven to eight to seven to ten day window roughly that they'll lay their eggs in. You can tell when the egg laying has kind of slowed down. So if you like change out your soil, you, they can lay new eggs. It's like it's literally like uh, the size of a grain of rice. They're one of their eggs, so it's super small, or probably even smaller, smaller than, smaller than a grain of rice. Um, but so whenever they stop laying eggs, ab yeah, about another week after that, like that's your window. That's when you harvest, harvest them. them. Yeah, and to harvest them, you basically so they're cold blooded. They prefer about 65 to 70 degrees temperature, or they could go, no, let's see. That's a different insect, I think. They can go a little bit higher. No, they prefer warmer. It's like 85, I think. Um, but whenever you raise the, or lower the temperature, they'll go into hibernation, and then you take your bins or whatever you're growing them in, and you can put them in the freezer. Mm. So collect, you know, like, you know, collect your crickets and then put them in the freezer, and that's how you kill them so mm -hmm. they basically go to sleep so it's an ethical way to go for them yeah look at you <laughs> god humane baby so but it's a humane what way to go what's that look like at scale like how are they doing that at scale massive facilities would just i mean it, are people yeah. doing it at scale yeah there's um there's a couple um there's one facility in austin texas that's about about over a hundred thousand square feet 
There's a couple in uh, Ontario that are like 60,000 square feet. And there's actually free range cricket barns. Oh, man. So <laughs> literally what they do is they just have uh, these, uh, they're called cricket condos is what they're called. So they're nice. just like. Uh, Patent pending. So they're basically like uh, flats of cartons that you can like, you can uh, groove into each other and yep. set up. And then you can easily, um, whenever the crickets are, they, they hang out on that and like crawl around in that and stuff. And that's what they prefer to hang out on. They put the food on top of that so they can climb on that. So what they do is when they harvest these guys, they will just um, take the food or have everyone go to one specific place. I would guess is take the food out and then lower the temperature, this. sweep everything up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there it goes. So yeah, what's the what's so do you put this do you grind these crickets up and put them in food or is it more of like a peanut where you you smoke them, you make them flavorful and you just pop them in your mouth Salt and eat them. Pepper. You can do both. Yeah. Yeah, we uh we actually started selling uh the the flavored crickets. So it's we had uh, just simply salt. And this is some of the, fla the flavor names. Simply salted uh, barbecue, lemon and garlic, uh, like hot chili or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like we had a couple different flavors that we were selling. And mm -hmm. so, are you exporting them? Or are you selling those in the United States market? Uh, we were selling them locally. What are the biggest companies in the space doing? Are they are they really trying? Is that what they're doing? Like the biggest companies that are doing this insect farming? Are they doing the packaged? you know, in the insect store. in the grocery some, store or are they making are. ingredients? Yeah, some are. Um, what's the biggest so, market? Like what, who's the bet? Like what's the best person doing? I guess. The pro say. So in my opinion, it's uh, the most adaptable and the most, the, where you get, you're going to get your higher adoption rate is the protein powders mm. um, ah. because you can just grind it up. And you won't even you taste just it. grind it up and it's, it's a protein powder. It's, you can make a uh, cricket flour, so it's basically flour and cricket powder mixed in up to a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and that's how you get your, uh, it's like a protein powder. Protein flour. Basically. Yeah. For protein it's, pancakes. Exactly. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. um, and then it has like crickets, it has about 65 to 70% protein. Um, and then compared to beef, I think it's like 43 right. or something like that. Chickens is like 30, I yep. think. So, and then it has uh, more iron than spinach, more calcium than milk. Um, there's um, a thing in the, <clears throat> if you grind them up, there's a thing in the shell. It's called chitin, which is a prebiotic. So it feeds healthy gut in your, or healthy um, uh, bacteria in your gut. So like feeds probiotics. Um, and it's called, it's called chitin, which is the same thing that's in uh, shrimp, the shells of shrimp. Because shrimp and crickets are closely related. So if you have a shellfish allergy, you might have an allergy to crickets. Oh, really? Yeah. So Interesting. That's, so that's like the only thing that's like, be careful, watch out, is like if so, you have a shellfish allergy. So you're telling me the monkeys had it right this whole time. They were just eating bugs out of each other's hair, and they knew something we didn't. A lot of protein. A lot of protein there. What did your family think uh, when you... Friends, family, yeah, everybody. When you're like, oh, I'm yeah. gonna do I this. Think this cricket farming. This is the this is the ticket. A lot of people have called me crazy. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people have called me crazy, but yep. um, well, that's all right. Okay. That means you're on okay. track. Yeah. Our good friend Bobby, uh, he's our barber. He he says if they don't if they aren't calling you crazy, then you're not doing something right. Yep. Cause yeah, because most people call you're not you crazy. going hard enough. You got you're kind of you're kind of got, got a long storyline here in this in college. You're. You are tackling a bunch of stuff. You're tackling a bunch of stuff now, but you are tackling a bunch of stuff then too. Yeah. So you are starting a, a cricket insect f company. Yep. Same time you're in college at Iowa State doing entrepreneurship and yep. ag biz. Yep. So you're doing all this. Where did, where do you end up at the end of the college? Are you still doing the insect farming company? Um, what what is it what's it all looking like yeah we um so i graduated in may of 2019 and um right after graduation there was this uh, summer program it's called sci starters and they give you um they give you a bunch of money to basically work on your business over the summer so that's what i did for a couple months uh try to go after some funding got didn't work 
didn't get the funding that we wanted. Uh, then we were, we were basically like, well, we're at a crossroads, you know, yeah. the, the lease for the college apartment was up. It's, it's, it's up at, you know, the beginning of July the cricket farm whatever. is in peril. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we gotta, we gotta make a decision here. Um, so went back on the, went back to the dairy farm to the original plan was to have something out there, have a little building out there or something. Um, but just got super busy with working on the dairy farm yeah. and, um, working uh meeting with grant every day over lunch he, shout out uh, grant hilbert he uh basically encouraged me to start a youtube channel um the the winter break before graduation and um i mean he he told me every day you know he's like you know you need to get on youtube yep. there's no dairy farmers you need to get on yep. youtube you need to do it and uh, i was like okay 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 and then uh, during winter break i shot a bunch of videos and i'm just I'm like, ah, this, this editing, the editing. Oh, so, yep. Yep. Editing. I feel yeah. that. Yeah. You guys know, it's just so much time to edit stuff. And it was just, it was just killing me. And I'm like, I, I can't do this. This isn't for you. I can't, can't do it. This is not fun. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And then, um, end of 2019 worked on the dairy farm for a couple of months. <clears throat> and then, um, in October of 2019, we actually, um, Annie, my wife and I, we went to, uh, visit, a bunch of other cricket farmers around the world. So we, uh, we got sponsored by Iowa state again, shout out to Iowa state and uh, <laughs> ag, ag entrepreneurship initiative. Um, we got sponsored by them to go to, to go to a bunch of different insect farms around the world. So, so, so you took a little break on the insect farming for just a f short amount of time, I, but you I, didn't leave the I, back. I didn't really take a break from it. I mean, I still was like trying to make things work. Uh, you know, it was like, okay, we got some space here. We can maybe make something yeah. work here, you know. It's and really then, a time thing more than anything else. Yeah, it's, it's just time. Right. Yeah, time takes, it just takes so much time. And so the dream wasn't dead yet. You were like, I'm doing this thing. I just, yeah. look, yeah. I need more time. Or yeah, I'm, no, it just didn't didn't pack up quite yet. Right. Um, but then uh, we, we visited all these farms and stuff around the world, uh, visited farms in, um, we visited a cricket farm in, uh, in Hawaii, uh, I went back and visited the same the um, mealworm slash black soldier fly larvae company in Australia called GoTerra. They uh, take food waste, and this was actually my original idea was to take waste from restaurants. So restaurant food waste. You know, you go to your your Mexican restaurant or whatever, they throw out half a burrito and yep. half a, three quesadillas and whatever, all that all that stuff. Take that stuff somehow turn it into feed for crickets, have crickets eat that, and then sell the crickets as like a a protein additive uh, or just a high protein source for uh, farmers or just whatever, uh, livestock, pigs, uh, or uh, fish meal. Yep. I don't know if you guys know too much about aquaculture. Right. But uh, a lot of fish, a lot of fish meal is made from dead fish parts, so it's a very unsustainable cycle. So a lot of opportunity that you could have done with a that. Lot, yeah. Though, so crickets. I mean, it's it, if if the protein aspect is there, because that's a, really all people look at is what's the protein. Yeah. What's the like, benefit of eating a cricket? What's, what's right. the number? You're just basically making it into an ingredient for mm. you know a food ingredient to yeah. fit the to fit the nutritional bill that they're yeah. they're building. Originally, originally, I was just wanting to have it be as a, a food source for people again. So just turn it right back to humans. But uh, I think there's something with the FDA. You have to have it go through like two biologicals or something. More complicated. It. So, yeah, it was something that you couldn't quite feed it back right to people. So like it'd have to go through, a, like waste would have to go through oh, a cricket. Oh, I got gotcha. And then a cow and then back as stick. Then to people. Or milk or whatever. Right. Like you can't have a cricket uh, you can't eat waste, Mexican food. Cricket, food. You can't have Mexican crickets going directly to people. <laughs> exactly. So you go on this trip and you are going to all these insect farms again across yeah. the, across yep. the world with your wife. Yep. And so the one company in Australia, they really inspired me as well to like, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not crazy. I have an idea that right. Yeah. Could work. Yeah. And, uh, she, she's basically, she doesn't look at herself as like a protein, company or alternative protein she looks at the company as a waste management company so they oh, have sure they built these uh shipping containers that about five tons of waste a day gets converted into protein so it's basically a turnkey solution that waste food waste goes in 
<clears throat> like McDonald's coffee grounds or, yep. you know, food, fast food restaurants or whatever. And they, she actually gets paid to take their waste because you have to pay someone to come pick up your garbage. Right. right? So she's like, okay, I'll just pay a little bit less than the guy before me. And, right. And get the waste. So she gets paid to take the inputs for her insect, for her insects, and then turns around and she sells the protein to livestock farmers. Yeah, that's pretty sharp. Pretty smart. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's, uh, I thought that was a really neat idea. And um, yeah, so that was Australia. Then went to Thailand as well, uh, ate a bunch of insects just in the street, just on in carts and stuff. And uh, yeah, because there's a lot of Thailand, a lot of people eat insects there and it's, it's very common there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then went to the Netherlands. We realized there was a couple companies in my home country that were working on insects as well. Uh, so visited a couple of those <clears throat> and then a couple of people, uh, in London, which now in the UK, uh, insects, last I heard insects were banned as a feed, food source, food, food or feed source. I can't remember which one it was, but it was big. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> They're just That's they, odd. like, I, I, maybe, maybe it's something, maybe, I, I don't know, I haven't read into it too much, but maybe they're coming at it from like a food safety perspective or mm-hmm. something. And they're like, oh, you're doing something wrong here, so we got to shut this down until we look into it. I I don't know what happened, but it's, it's a weird thing, I thought, for someone to just shut down a potential very viable protein source. So you get back from this, all this knowledge, all this motivation, inspiration, you're just like, what what do you do then? Yeah, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so, got back in November of 2019 from that trip, and um, <clears throat> I downloaded TikTok. I think in like September of 2019, and I was just like, ah, whatever, it doesn't mean anything. Posted a couple of videos, got a couple hundred views, and then uh, I working came, on your dairy dairy farm, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I just. Okay. I just shoot some ra- stuff, random stuff. I don't even yeah. know, you know, just the typical first TikToks, right? Um, where you just have no idea what you're doing, right? And um, so post a couple TikToks, whatever, and then came back from uh, all the all that traveling, and then I was working the night shift, and uh, there was this cow that had a calf, and she was eating afterbirth, and I'm like, and I I made a TikTok about it, TikTok oh boy, TikTok went viral, yeah. So that that was my first. Viral Aha moment. TikTok. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was um and that's basically it was like four or five days after uh got back from that trip. So that was an eye opener. You were like, Whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> There's a market here. Crazy. Yeah, it was crazy, yeah. And that was just like, Okay, you know what what happened here? Why 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 did this go or what happened? Why did this go viral or whatever? And uh the reason that I was using TikTok was because it was there was no editing. Right, you easy know, to you, use. It's just it's super yep. easy. Shoot to use. and go. Fifteen a fifteen second video takes you twenty five to thirty seconds to make. Yep. Mm-hmm. It it doesn't take anything, and um, so that was um, I really you know kind of uh, put my mind you know made made that and made yeah. a mental note of that like okay it's it's pretty easy to do TikToks, um, so then decided to really start to go ham on it um, after that you know the first viral video you kind of. Yeah, get a little rush, and it's like, oh, that's kind of fun. That's cool. Yeah, and right. It's like, oh, let's see if I can do that again. You know? Right. And then, um, so I just started started p- posting a bunch of videos and going hard on TikTok. Yeah. Now, like thirty seven hundred videos later or something. Yeah. One point nine million followers. Wow. So wow. at the crazy videos. So did you kind of put? Are, so are you still doing the insect farming now? Are you still pursuing that dream? Is that still a business? Is it, like so is that still in the works? I or did you kind of put it on the back burner for this TikTok thing and the dairy farm and everything else you're doing? Um, so it I, it was put on the back burner, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then which I'm not 100 percent set on that for ever. I mean, I want I want to do that. Mm-hmm. I yeah. want to do that eventually. That it will be part of my life eventually. Okay. Yep, like, I will be an insect farmer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but um, basically. So right now, working at the indoor farm, trying to get this company scaled and trying to get that sold. Um, so I, I'm i just focusing my time right now on that, basically. Right. So I'm just trying to take that take that, and focus on that. And then uh, after, probably after a couple of years or something, I'll, I'll get into it. Because um, I've, I've been watching the industry and 
well, it's just been kind of steady. So it's not like I'm missing a huge, right. huge hockey stick. It's just there. waiting for your innovation to push it over It's just there. waiting oh. for you, Huey. I guess. Yeah. It's just sitting there. Yep. So you're doing that and you're working on the dairy farm. How do you end up working in vertical farming? Um, so I was uh, working at the dairy farm for almost two years and, um, you know, full time or whatever. Um, so a lot of hours yep. and um, just realized, you know, I wanted I wanted to have uh, kind of a bigger impact than doing day to day things. Yep. Um, like, not saying that dairy farming dairy farming has a huge impact on obviously on all of us that right. eat food and drink milk and everything. Um, but from what I was doing in my daily work, I didn't think I was having the impact that I could have in this world. Right. So I decided to uh, look for other opportunities, and um, that that one of them came up and that was the indoor farm in Ames. So how did you find out about that? So through my entrepreneurial ventures at Iowa state, um, I was part of this program called the ag student, ag EI student incubator. And, uh, that's where I met Mitchell too, which yep. is, uh, funny that he, he's from here. Um, met Mitchell there and, and a couple other companies or other, um, people that have also since sold companies, um, so that was a really, really good crowd that I found myself in. Uh, that group was let, led by uh, my now boss, Clayton Mooney, the uh, founder okay. of uh, Nebulum. Um, so he was, uh, he was the entrepreneur in residence, and um, that which uh, he led the group that all these people were in, and uh, we basically... Uh, Reconnected. Just, yeah, was, you know, we've kept in contact and stuff, and I, I, I'll talk to him occasionally, or I, I talk to him occasionally about advice or whatever because he's uh just i think he's just 30 or just he's super young so, yeah you know good just resource a couple, couple of years ahead of me yep um so kept in contact and then i just asked him you know do you know any do you know any startups because i knew i wanted to work for a startup yeah um because high risk high reward right why not mm-hmm. um because like uh, I, I knew, so I knew I wanted to do high risk, high reward for a startup. And then, uh, he was like, okay, you know, what are you looking for? Blah, blah, blah. Um, I was like, okay, just, you know, I'll take more, more sweat equity over. And if, for people who don't know sweat equity, it's basically, um, you get a piece of the company for your time instead yep. of getting money. Right. Um, so instead of, you know, a salary, I'd rather take some sweat equity and yeah. just have, have something bigger in the end if it works. Exactly. Yep. yep. You don't have the money to invest, but you have the time and invest. So you're, if it pays off, you're rewarded for that time. Yeah. And, and, and luckily, um, I was able to, um, you know, I had, I had a little money already from working on the dairy farm. I'm, I made, I made good money. Yeah. You make good money working on the dairy farm, but it's, it's just a lot of hours. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you, you can make really good money. Um, but yeah, he uh, basically reached out and said, um, you know, we actually <clears throat> we actually have two oppositions or two positions that I think you would be pretty good in. And uh, one of them was kind of, you know, he was looking at uh, building in public. So that's that's the big thing um, with some companies now. They want to build in public. So they show their metrics, show their like not their revenue, but like their subscribers and how many people are signing up and how many people are leaving and all that stuff and like how much production and stuff they're doing. Um, so that was um, a big thing that he wanted to push and he saw my TikTok. And he's oh, like, sure. You know, he's like, you, you know how to build in public because you've, yep. you've basically shown everybody a little peek behind the curtain of what goes on in, in dairy farming right. with your TikTok. So, so do the same thing here. Yeah, so like if you... You know, if you if you wanted to, you could do do the same thing here, and then um, you know, I still wanted to farm, of course, because mm-hmm. I I love farming. Right. right. So I wanted to. Who do, doesn't? Right. I mean, who doesn't love farming? Um, still wanted to farm. So then uh, there was a production position available as well. So then um, <clears throat> started working working um, with with someone there, and um, then after a couple months, came a production lead at this this company. So now I basically am in charge of from whenever the seed seeds come into the farm to whenever the lettuce gets delivered to someone's doorstep. You're the lead guy of that whole deal. So you are doing social media still 
promoting the the farm you, or, or the company you work at. Yep. And you still do you still work on the dairy farm? No. Nope. Done with no that. More. Yep. So TikTok that and everything you're doing is for the ultimate goal to start your insect farm. Is that your why right now? Is that like everything that you're trying to do right now is for that end goal? Um yeah, so there's like there's people you know, you can you hear like things that uh, people abroad, you know, they're poor and they can't afford food in like third world countries and stuff. But there's a lot of people in this country right. that can't afford food. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of kids in high school lunch lines that, you know, they have to go, they have to wait for the smaller portion of, of food. And that's, that's something that's not good. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of, that is more. Your why. An, an overarching goal. Um, mm-hmm. Because, like, I, 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 I do want to do stuff uh, abroad and, you know, have a bigger, like, a world, world impact eventually. Uh, but there's a lot of things that can be done here as well, right. I think. Um, so, and I think insects can be a great part of supplementing people's needs for protein, yeah. just protein, just food. I kind of get the feeling you're just like, as long as I'm learning something, as long as I'm growing you're just honing your skills until yeah. the right opportunity comes along. Yeah. Yeah. The business that you're with now, what is their model as far as are they direct to consumer? Are they wholesaling their product? What is their so I guess give us some background, like how big is this operation? What all are they growing? And what's their what's their model? Yeah. So um <clears throat> the model for the business is we're We're basically, we're vertically integrated from, like I said earlier, from when the seed comes into the farm, um, from that process on, we do everything. We do the seeding, the transplanting, and then we do the harvesting. And then we also bag up the lettuce and I'll I'll tell you which products we will bag up the, the greens and then deliver them to people's doors. So Annie, my wife, she actually does the deliveries in her SUV. Yeah. So there you go. (laughs) So it's, uh, that, which right now it's, uh, that's, it's, it's one of the, it's a scalable model. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't need a truck, right? We don't need a semi, a straight truck or a semi, or, you know, you don't need to hire an an Uber eats driver that expects this, everything to be good at this time. And this, and this, if you have someone in house, to do that stuff. So to be vertically integrated again, you have, you have that last step and then you also have uh, a better customer interaction. So that's another Mm -hmm. reason why why, she's the face. She, she, she delivers with a smile. So you both are in the company, work in the company together. Yeah. Yeah. We both are. That's cool. So your consumer, your customer, is it individuals? Is it restaurants? Is it both? It's, it's, so we're mostly direct to consumer uh, company. So we deliver uh, lettuce, microgreens, and like Swiss chard to consumers directly to their house. Okay. We offer free delivery. Yep. Um, and actually we're in Iowa city and Cedar Rapids now too. Wow. Um, so we have, we offer free delivery to Ames, Ames area, Des Moines area and Cedar Rapids and Iowa city area. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, so every other week we have a Friday, <clears throat> we have a Cedar Rapids and yeah. Iowa city run. Um, so we just did one, uh, yes, or today, Saturday. Yeah. Yesterday we ha- we went to Iowa city and, Cedar Rapids. Um, but we, we do have a couple restaurants that we sign on, but with our model, the way that with, with indoor farming in general, like a lot of indoor farms, they want to go wholesale, but mm-hmm. wholesale, then you're just a commodity. Yes. Right. There's no connection. There's yeah. no, it's the same exact thing as hog farmer going direct to consumer mm-hmm. because otherwise you're just producing every pig's, my pigs are the same as somebody else's pigs. Yep. And, and what makes you different? It. Once their air tag is out or whatever, right. it's, it all looks So you guys want to kind of keep that direct to consumer model first. Like that's yeah. kind of the mission to keep that yeah. connection. Yeah. Is it a subscription? Yep. So, so people so people can sign up online for a subscription at eatlettuce.com. I love it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty right good. Right on your water bottle there, yeah. eatlettuce.com. Okay. Everybody go check it out. <laughs> Yep. Um, so you, people sign up for a subscription either uh, weekly, every other week, or every month, mm-hmm. and then they can choose between um, half pounds, a pound of uh, butterhead. So we have, so the products are uh, red butterhead, uh, red fire oak leaf, and then we have Swiss chard, 
the yeah. bright bright lights Swiss chard. I don't know if you've ever seen Swiss chard. It's yeah. Like, there is ma- I I harvested a one and a half pound Swiss chard head. Wow. wow. One seed grew. Or one I don't know. This is kind of scaring me because if if it was that easy to get good greens like that, Trish would have me on a, she'd have me slim down because she loves that butterhead. Is it what you call it? Is it called? Butterhead. Yeah. Butterhead. She loves that. Yeah. Every yeah, time so. that we can get that, um, she's like, isn't this just the best lettuce? I could just eat a salad every day. That just three different types of lettuce. Uh, so the, the red butterhead is lettuce. The red fire is lettuce. And then the Swiss chard is Swiss chard. It's a leafy, leafy okay. Swiss chard. It's a leafy green, but it's it's not like lettuce. It has like a like a long stalk, like celery. I think I saw a TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, those are the three main. Those are the three products you guys grow. Th- those, and then we also have microgreens, which are basically sprouts of other greens. So like uh, we have micro radish which is just the tiny version of a radish bulb. So you get um, the, the, the nutrients are a lot more concentrated. So same thing with broccoli sprouts. So we have, we have broccoli sprouts and then we have pea shoots, which um, pea shoots, they're, it says on the bag, it's a cover crop. <laughs> 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 but we are growing pea shoots and they, they're, they get about this, about this tall. Holy cow. And so the tray, the trays, you know, it's a 10 by 20 inch tray. And the, they'll just like be like, you know, just a bush, yeah. basically. Um, so that that's one of the one of really good product as well. But um, yeah, so three microgreens, and then we have three of the leafies, and then we have tomatoes as well. So wow. small small nice. production of tomatoes. We have um, we have a lot of people on the wait list for tomatoes. Yeah. So do you think what's the most popular, and then. What's the most profitable, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, the most popular is, so I think it's it's a little skewed because we, we started off with only offering a, a pound of butterhead to right. everybody, a pound or um, a pound weekly or a pound every other week or a pound and microgreens. So <clears throat> it, we, uh, we have just recently in the last like three months, now started offering half pounds and half pounds of the of the other variety of lettuce because um, we we just had one Two, right one yeah. the butterhead mm-hmm. and then uh, the the red fire we were just selling that to restaurants mm. uh, just one restaurant in Des Moines um, Hawk so they're they're a pretty good place too um, and then we we so we switched over that everybody could say everybody could switch up their their subscription or whatever get a variety yeah so now we've seen we've seen a lot like it's kind of balanced out mm-hmm. yeah. um but a lot of the a lot of people like the the oak leaf lettuce so it's gotcha. really, it's really good and then the microgreens as well they're they're pretty popular you can use them on a little garnish or whatever yeah so just i was gonna ask is that for more for like garnishing your dishes and stuff yeah or you can just put them on a salad okay your customer what draws them to what you're doing so, uh, so some of our value propositions are the the shelf life. So we have about four times longer shelf life because they're getting it so groceries. fresh. Yeah, yep. So, it hasn't been bagged from wherever they're getting it and brought to a warehouse and then no. distributed. And by the time it gets to so, the store, it's already been in the bag for ten days. Yeah, on average, it's about ten days. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> most lettuce comes from Arizona or California yep. in the winter, especially. So we have year-round weekly production. So we stagger all the production. So we have, we're so um, the lettuce is in the units for about four weeks. So we have every week we basically harvest one quarter of the farm. Yeah, you've got it staggered so that you've got fresh stuff every week. The shelf life. Yeah, so yep. the shelf life is a big one uh, because it takes you know like yeah. ten or eleven days to get to the grocery store, and then you have about three, four, five, six days to left until it's mush. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's really a big one is the shelf life. And then, um, another thing we like to point out whenever, uh, we talk about shelf life is lettuce, it loses about a third of its nutrients in the first three days mm-hmm. of, of its life, of its shelf life. So as soon as you harvest it, the clock starts ticking mm-hmm. and then you just, you lose nutrients every yeah, and every the longer day. it sits. Yeah. Uh, cause it just degrades. Um, so that's a big thing. It's it's a little more nutritious because it's yeah. fresh too. And then the free delivery is yeah. a big one. Um, and then um, using, we're using hydroponics. So you can save a lot of water 
by using hydroponics. So the water savings, um, cause you're recycling that water. Like it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's turning over. Yeah. So the, um, <clears throat> so basically what hydroponics is, is basically, um, the plants are in no soil and only water. Yep. So it, it runs the, the water, the nutrients, the water has everything that the plants need and the nutrients is in the water. And then there's artificial lighting. <clears throat> so led lights, yep. uh, the costs have come down a lot recently from, or, you know, the past like five or six years with led lighting and stuff. So they've gotten a lot better. Yeah. And I, I would think that and you, maybe, you know, this, what's the, obviously you're, you from a, you know, from a carbon footprint or from an environmental standpoint, you're eliminating a heck of a lot of transportation costs from haul from, you know, yeah. how it's distributed, food, but food miles, food miles, but there's a cost there because I'm assuming that even with LEDs, the pumps and everything, there's a cost for what it, the, the amount utilities. of power and the amount of utilities it takes. Like, how does that, do you have any idea what the comparison is for the way you're growing that lettuce versus Arizona, growing in Arizona California. and trucking it? How's that? So how's that drive? Um, I don't know like the exact numbers and stuff yeah. of the, like how much it costs exactly for like per. Yeah. Per I'm just thinking or whatever. Yeah. Comparison um, but so for like production wise, I know we can produce about 20 pounds per square foot per year, which is, uh, outdoor lettuce is about one. Okay. So yeah, we're, so it's uh, we're way more productive, yeah. way more productive per, per square, square foot. foot. And so land use. Yeah. So in about a thousand square feet, you can grow about fifteen to twenty thousand pounds per year. Yeah, in a thousand. That's pretty impressive. Feet. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. So, do you think? So, do you feel like this industry is young, just like the insect industry is? Do you feel like there's? It's just kind of getting getting its feet under yeah. itself. Yeah, I think it's about the same. Um, the same. It's a little more mature than the. In, the not a little more. It's a lot more mature. Um, like there's, you know, there's a couple big players like Plenty Foods, um, Bowery, Bowery Farms, yeah. Yeah, Gotham Greens, um, Arrow Farms is another big one. Um, so there, there is a couple, couple big players, like you know, that have gotten investment from behemoths like yeah. Amazon, venture capital, and stuff, and all and, that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, there's money flowing and stuff, and yeah, there's, there's things happening. But I think a lot of uh, companies they spend a lot of time just in the lab. You know, they're like, oh, we're going to work on per growing the perfect strawberry. And it's like, strawberries are great, but yeah, is they're that, pretty much that, perfect the way they are. That, Just get them growing. Yeah. Is that the most the, effective the thing that you want to be focusing on? You know, because yeah. it takes two years to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of throwing seeds in uh, some rock wool cubes and just, just get it going, trying it. Yeah. You're, yeah, you seem like you're kind of go with the flow. Like you're just, you're living life right now. You're getting, taking the opportunities that are coming at you and you know that you want to start your thing. Your own, maybe do your own thing in the future. But has this kind of shifted your mind? Maybe that, well, maybe someday I kind of want to do maybe my own indoor produce farm. Or do you still kind of want to, like, are you just set on the insect farming? Like, I, I feel like it'd be hard to be so invested into something so cool and new and learning all this stuff and then not having maybe an interest to maybe go out on your own and do something. One of the first things I'm going to do when I have kind of a, a bigger place of my own and kind of a sizable place is set up an indoor farm <laughs> <laughs> so I can grow my own food. You know, yeah. mm. I'm just going to start because um, I'm, I'm all the knowledge I've gained from just like the past, you know, it's um, in a couple of weeks, it'll be a year that I've been at this company and I've learned so much and I've, I've been, uh, I've been amazed at how easy it really is to grow things indoors. Um, so that's, that's one, that's at least that I'll take away from it. You know, like Just growing your own produce yourself, yeah, you yeah. and your wife, Gro which growing, she knows the pro does she know the stuff. process too a little bit? Yeah. 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 yeah that's yeah, cool. She, My question about this is, and this goes back to when talking to, um, Magnus about, uh, Bitcoin, one of the things that made them want to invest and build a Bitcoin mine in Iowa was because we've got cheap power compared power. to everybody else. Yeah. So do you think that the the indoor farming, 
do you think that lends itself to like places like Iowa that have cheap power and we have plentiful water? I mean, right now we still have plentiful water um, because I know that's one of the big issues when you go out west is, you know, a lot of these farms that are farming in the dirt, say in the California, uh, what is that? The San Fernando Valley that were so big on agriculture. Well, now then they're fighting because water water is such a huge yeah. deal. <sighs> Let's see how to answer that. Um, and I know that's kind of an out. I just kind of thought that as I was sitting here. So you can tell me yeah, what you I, think. I, so that that's actually um, my first thing that came to mind was um, that was a thing in my pitch about insect farming. You know, it's, it's cheap in Iowa. Yeah. We're in Iowa. Energy is cheap. I think we're the 10th, 10th cheapest state yeah. in the country yeah. for energy, uh, for kilowatt hours. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, it makes sense why Amazon moves here. Yep. Um, Microsoft. Microsoft, Apple, like Apple had their, you know, they had the Data thing. Center. In, yeah. Uh, Apple, Facebook. Uh, they've been there for years in Altoona. Yep. Um, and um, Des Moines, Ames is a very unique location because you have 80 and 35, which yep. connects the country from corner to corner. Yep. I mean, up, up, up and down. Yep. North, and, south, east, and west. east and west. Um, so I think Iowa is a great place to do yeah. big business, yeah. <laughs> especially for food. Well, yeah, especially for food production again, because you have, you have your cattle right there and you have, if, if you decide to go with a grain based diet, you have your grain right there. Yep. Um, and another thing uh, that I was thinking about housing is using old grain bin sites because they already have power and they already have a structure there that's massive and strong, but yeah, for insects or for insects. either insects or yeah. you, could, yeah. you could do indoor farming in a grain bin if you there wanted you to. Yeah. Uh, do you ever think, cause like, it feels like these massive, you know, these big companies in the vertical farming space, they kind of do everything in house themselves. Do you think it'll ever get to the point where they hire out contract growers? Like they teach, let's say dad and I to build a small facility here on our farm and, and they, they teach us, and we just grow the product for them, and then they sell it and market it however they want. Kind of like what we do with our ho with hogs now. You yeah. Know? So that's that's actually um, <clears throat> a great way to scale. Mm -hmm. That's 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 probably how it's gonna look. Um, there's there's prop. My guess is there's gonna be, you know, just a couple or not a couple, but more more than a couple of farmers out there that are doing, you know, <clears throat> that want to diversify be yeah. beyond just crops and pigs and, um, you know, maybe they have a couple of cows too, whatever, yeah. or YouTubing. You yeah. know? Right. I mean, you, yeah, you, you got to diversify however you can. I'll be honest. Yeah. Like, that's why I asked the question because we're here and <laughs> well, we're, 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 I'm interested in this space and it's something that I think the world is moving more towards. Yeah. It's a hedge event. It's a hedge against, you know, let's be honest, plant-based diets are becoming more and more popular and it's just a hedge against that and it's an opportunity. Yeah. And so I don't want to be the guy that is running, <laughs> you know, Nebulum or, you know, you know, anything like that. But I think it'd be cool to have my own little farm that I could grow some, grow well, some produce in and, you know, get paid a dollar amount for however much that I produce. And that's I, something that I like. I think that where we're at, it, this is, we went, I looked at this years ago when the, the aquaponics, there were some guys up in Northern Iowa that converted, they actually they converted, converted a hog barn. Yeah. And they were growing them. I know about these guys. But yeah. my only deal with it was I, I, I love the idea of doing it, but I don't want to have to market it. I don't want to have to sell it. Yeah. I would like to be able to, you know, build the facility, do a really good job of producing the product and partner with somebody who's really good at marketing it and them handle that. <laughs> cause I don't want that headache. And that's, that's why, cause I feel like, you know, here you've got the, when it comes to power, we've already, we're using solar today on our hog buildings and I love it. It's one of the best things I ever did because since I put that system in my power has gone gotten more expensive every year but my power bill stays the same nice and if i was to build aquaponics or i was to build a vertical farm i would do solar i i just know yeah. i would yep i have the water i have the land 
I just don't want to have to worry about the distribution. I think there's probably a lot of people like well, that. Well, I was going to say the marketing for us now is a little bit different than when you were thinking about doing that True. before because now we have a, a brand and doing that would be... Yeah, you could. Add, I mean, <laughs> I'm just I saying we don't have to do the distribution for sure. Yeah, I get what yeah. you're saying. I, I feel wanna... like our time is best spent. And I think a lot of people are this. If you're a farmer, most farmers want to farm. They want to farm. It's the it's the um, it's, it's the, the process the of take, you know? of growing something, whether that be growing a pig, a cow, you know, producing milk or growing. It's very lettuce. satisfying. Yeah, yeah very, that's satisfying. It's very <laughs> satisfying to see a calf. Yep. grow up to have its own calf. Right, mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. So at, I was talking about, and when I was, when earlier I was talking about insect farming, that mm-hmm. would be the way to like contract growers yep. and stuff. Um, for the lettuce, uh, what we're thinking is uh, to have, so like to, to have this farm that we're building in Ames, <clears throat> to have that basically be the playbook for other smaller like multiples of a thousand square foot locations yep. other in other places so like yeah so uh, you can cover so you can because the distribution is the hard part because like you said you want to get it to people fresh quick yeah our because a- our average distance from the farm is about five miles in Ames yeah and it's like 37 miles in Des Moines which mm-hmm. Ames is just like 20 or it's like 30 miles from Des Moines so it's like right it's just the distance that it's away from the from yep. Ames but yeah, the the food miles. That's another another big thing that we uh, talk to people about or yeah. try to push because it's instead of you know our average is our average is eighteen miles yeah. for for everything. Yeah, so instead of eighteen hundred miles right. to Arizona or California, you know, do you do you feel like right now it's too complex to, of a system to just hand over? I'm obviously not hand over, but let's say Dad and I wanted to build a vertical farm here for somebody if you did the contract growing do you think it's evolved enough where you could teach us and us two could run it or do you feel like you have to have a facility like nebulum has where they have these got to have multiple workers there i could to I run could everything teach you how to run it and, and be careful what you're you're talking about bit. sawyer be careful what you're agreeing to well, not. he's not agreeing to anything but you are getting my i think you are you getting could, my wheels turning I think a little you bit teach me I don't know whether. I mean, it is something that I've thought about definitely. I mean, I had no, I didn't really have any experience growing indoors right. or growing veg. Not not too. I had some experience growing vegetables outside in Hawaii uh, when I was there for like you know the stint that I was there, um, but I didn't have much experience growing vegetables indoors. Uh, which that I, um, it's just about the. When, once you get things figured out, it's it, it, you just figure it out, right? Mm-hmm. Right. You, when 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 things go wrong, it's like, oh well, what happened? First thing you go to is Google or YouTube. <laughs> yep. Right. There's yep. probably someone who's had that same, same problem, problem before. Right. And if there isn't, that's might even be better because then you can figure it out and then you can make a YouTube video on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because there's there's a lot of that's a lot of that's a big gap to fill too is teaching more things on YouTube. So. Today, you're 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 probably about the most stable that you've been in a while, and the fact that you kind of gotten into a a rhythm of working where you're working and doing what you're doing. But what is so? Where's the social media go versus your your current job versus what do you want to do? Like, how do you balance that? Well, and you're married. I didn't realize that you were married. Yep. So. How do you balance this juggernaut? Long, sometimes long days. Yeah, yeah. Um, I bet. <clears throat> yeah, which that's okay. Um, yeah, it, which it it's and you have to do things that people don't want to do if you want to live a lifestyle or live a life that people want to live. That, yeah, that don't. That's what like, I always say. People live. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, it's it's not too bad right now. Like the 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 indoor farm, it that really cut down on my hours on, on the, on working basically. Um, so had a a little more time to, um, you know, work with the social media and stuff and like go to TikTok meetups and stuff and do do that stuff, uh, which is more, it's more fun than anything, you know, and more fun than work really. Um, so it doesn't really feel like work either. No, right. That's, I guess that's probably the, the key to it is it doesn't really feel like work. Like, Working at the indoor farm, it's you know compared to doing pigs or doing dairy farm, it's 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 pretty easy. You know, yep. I don't mm-hmm. have to walk around and 
shit all day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and like there's sometimes where, you know, things will things will break and you know, there's a pump that malfunctions and you know, you get you get a wet shirt from laying on the floor or something sometimes, but like yeah. It's still just water. Yeah, right. right. That's right. That's <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> On average, how long do you have to be in the farm actually like working in there? Or is it pretty much automated if you just make sure everything's uh, so, good? Uh, the harvesting is still like the harvesting, transplanting, uh, cleaning. That's still some of the some manual processes. Um, but I spend probably probably about 40 hours a week doing farm work. And then another and a little portion of my time doing uh, working on the business, um, like improving processes. Um, like for example, one thing I'm uh, working on right now is, uh, <clears throat> a system where basically you have uh, QR codes at every level that you can harvest. So, and every level that you can har- so we have different levels of lettuce. So like each, uh, stack of NFTs, which is not non-fungible token. It's nutrient film technique. Okay. Ooh. NFT. You got me NFT. all excited right there. <laughs> Sound bite. NFT, NFT. Um, so the, uh, so I, I wanted to have something where you can have every level, you have something that's identi- an identifiable code basically where it's like, okay, we harvested this, this many pounds from this level at this time. So basically all your production becomes time stamped. And then, you can work with that data um, to improve harvesting times, improve yeah. and just improve and processes. Because well, you know what? Yeah, when when you measure things, you know yep. things. Measuring is knowing. Yep. Um, so that's uh, that's something I've, I'm I'm working on, kind of in the background and stuff. And then um, we have like our, our labels, for example, that people have um, just put on something there, where every time we they get a customer gets an order their number of gallons of water that they've saved increases wow. correlationally the, in correlation to how many orders they've had. Gotcha. So, so they have like a customer profile and it gets to see what they're doing in environment. That yeah. is a smart. That's that very smart. smart. Yeah. So it's like. Makes them feel good about their purchase. It, yeah. It kind of gamifies it a little bit. Too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I think we'll be able to do some cooler things in the That's future. That's genius. Uh, like, you know, oh, you're, you're at, 12 or like, you know, you have 13 deliveries, two more deliveries, you get a free pea shoe or something like mm-hmm. that, you know? Um, so anyways, just like fun little things. I work on that in the back. Yeah, that's smart. And, yeah, uh, so definitely. Things to <laughs> improve processes. And You're the only, the second person that I've ever used the phrase that I've heard use the frame. It kind of gamifies it because that <laughs> is Sawyer's, your generation, that's something like to us, I don't think about it, but your generation that like clicks because Sawyer's yeah. like, Oh yeah, you kind of yeah, do people this. like a little game. They want to, they yeah. want to be, it's like, yeah. it's like finding the prize at the end. At right. The bottom of the cereal. People like that. Well, they, you've been, you guys grew up on the idea of progressing, le- progressing up. through leveling up and getting reward for it. And that's, and that's kind of, um, that's kind of been, uh, something that's I've seen too, like coming from the Netherlands where there's no, not room, no. no room to grow. Right. Like it's, it's capped. Yep. You can't grow. Yep. That's right. <laughs> and you come, you're coming and then coming over here, you know, it's like, Blame, it's like, your oyster. You can do whatever you want if you just want to Yeah, it's, it's go for it. it. Opportunities are endless. Yeah. And, um, like the country, the nut, the Netherlands is only the third, a third the size of Iowa. Yeah. Which, you know, crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. How big, how big Iowa is. And Iowa is, Nothing compared to Texas, you right? Know? Yeah, like, exactly. it's crazy. I've done some I've done some research on vertical farming, and one of the things that people say is a struggle right now is with all the utilities, and it's a startup. I understand that, but with all how much it costs to produce all these products, it's not as profitable as it could be if you got the costs down a little bit more. So, is it is it profitable right now? Can you are you guys making money? I know it's kind of personal or. Um, like, is so, it a profitable business that if someone wanted to start it, they could make so money? So it takes about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to deploy a farm, yep. and one farm, <clears throat> when it's fully up and going, it can produce about three hundred thousand dollars in annual recurring revenue. So your ARR is three hundred thousand, and costs to run it are, I I don't know the exact number of the cost to run it, but to set it up, it's like one hundred fifty thousand. 
Um, and that's with, you know, with current pricing where yep. we're basically buying retail for input. We're yeah. buying retail lights, you know, we're yeah. buying things that you're not price. buying on volume to where you're getting at a wholesale price. Right. We're not buying, you know, for 12 farms at a yeah. time. So we're getting, you know, 25% discount or something. Right. So mm-hmm. that's, that's with retail prices. Um, so we're hoping to even bring that down, bring that cost down even more when we expand, do deploy other farms. But, uh, the profitability is when you get multiple farms. So like scale. multiple farms that scale, uh, with, uh, a couple employees doing like, so one person does the deliveries, one person does like uh, a lot of the PR, local PR, mm-hmm. um, preferably it's someone who is from that area right. and already knows 20 people that would chomp at the bits to sign up. Yep. I mean, that that would be the ideal scenario, but mm-hmm. right. um, you know, like we've, when we launched in Cedar Rapids, we had um, our threshold, we said we want to have at least 20 deliveries and we'll start delivering every other week to Cedar Rapids. And we just open it up and uh, just through our network, we had 25 in like 48 hours. Wow. So do you have to cut it off? Like, are you no. are you production constrained as far as, do you have more demand than what you can deliver today? Right yeah, now, that's yes. A good so there's a wait list? Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. a wait list for mm-hmm. a few things, uh, which... That's that's my job. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Get rid of that wait list. Right. Um, so the couple, couple uh, last couple of weeks now we've been. I mean, we ever since we've started, um, the company's had about five hundred percent growth in twenty twenty one. Wow. So that's we crazy. we were at uh, sixty subscribers at the beginning of twenty twenty one, and we ended the year with three hundred. Wow. So we just there you go. Just be, yeah, massive ballooned. I got to backtrack a minute. Um, so. In like the lettuces that you grow, what's the what's the cycle on that? Well, how much time from se- seven, seven weeks? Seven weeks from yeah. seeding. Yeah. So you're 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 seeding every week in in each thing that you're doing, so that you every week you're harvesting yep. to so, fill those orders. Yeah. So I yeah. have I have right now I have uh, seven generations yeah. of lettuce. Right. Yeah. yeah and seven so generations. as you see your market grow. The facility that you're in today, like how much scalability do you have in that? Whereas, you know, okay, I, today I've got to, pl- right now, I, every week I got to do four trays of this. Mm-hmm. How, you know, when you see that growth, okay, well, now I need to do six trays. Going forward, yep. we need six. How far can you take the facility that you're in? How much growth can you do before you need another facility? So we can, um, we can deploy a couple more units and uh, we can supply up to about, I think, five, five or six hundred subscribers. And we're at yeah. 350 right now. That um, gives so you we, an idea of how big that market is. It's, it's pretty big. And that's, I mean, that, that's just for right now, what we're doing is just Ames, Des Moines, and then Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. We have yeah. right. less well, people. But like, it's, and just Ames, Ames is just sixty thousand people with right. Iowa State students. Right. And we don't right. have a lot of students that sign up. No, for right, because right. they they just have dad's money and to, tacos and yeah, yeah, they right. want the junk food. Right, right. exactly. But Blaze Pizza. Yeah, I mean you can't fault them. Yeah, <laughs> it is good. Yeah, there. Which the, yeah, there. There's definitely a market for it, and just people knowing where their food comes from. Right. Huge. Which which that's another big thing about the building in public. You know yep. we. I I have many videos of the farm, the, in, the inside of the farm, and there's a lot of companies you will never see the inside of their farm, right? Because R and D, and we're we're doing this, and we can't clo- we can't open those curtains, you know? Right. right. But we we just you know okay, here's our seeding process, here's the transplant. Like we, I transparency. Explain, I explain yeah. everything. People yeah. love that shit. Yeah, yeah, because at the end of the day, and I think that's something so many companies are finding out late is. Your your secrets aren't your asset. Your connection to your consumer is your asset. Yep. And so at the end of the day, what you have, that audience that you have, that transparency you have, and the relationship you have with your customer, it's worth way more than... I mean, I get... big growing technology. Yeah, I mean, I get that side of it. Like, they don't want to get it out because they don't want all the other companies to pick up on what their new research is, but... But if they can't connect with their but consumer... But I mean, uh, that's just one part of their business. It's not like their whole farm is a research lab. Like, right. go show all everything else that you're doing that's mainstream. Yeah, yeah so like, 
<clears throat> that was uh, another big thing during the pandemic when the pandemic started. Um, all this, the supply chain was just crazy. Terrible. You couldn't you couldn't buy eighty twenty right. to build out these systems. the The lead time went from six weeks to sixteen weeks. Yeah. And as a startup, you can't scale based on a sixteen week week timeline. Yeah. You can't do that. Um, so we had to go back and basically we're like, okay, what do we do as a company? We grow lettuce, we sell lettuce, and then we deliver that lettuce. Yeah. So we basically just went back to systems that, cause we were trying to build some systems with some R and D and trying to reinvent the wheel. And we, yep. we, we did, we increased uh, production from like 10, 10 pounds per square foot to 12 to 15 pounds per square foot with that, with those units that the company was building. But then uh, with the, what's what, with what we're doing right now, it's like 20 pounds per square foot. And we were like, okay, this unit produces really well. This unit does not produce very well. We need more lettuce. Let's make more of those units. Yeah. And it, it just, you, you just went back to the basics yep. and it's like, what are, what are we doing? We grow, sell and deliver lettuce. So let's just grow, sell and deliver lettuce. Yep. You know, right. it's maximize not, what we need to maximize. Keep exactly. it simple, stupid. That's exactly. how it goes. Yeah. Yep. And that's, that's the, the beauty of the scalability too. It's, it's something simple. that you can, you can it's have, repeatable. Yeah. It's scalable, repeatable. Yeah. You could teach people it, you could work. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then like a lot of the, like, say we have another farm in Minneapolis or something or, you know, wherever Chicago or wherever, um, you know, the, the Ames farm would take care of, you know, the software, the website, yep. like all the, the, the hard stuff, you know, yep. the only thing that farm has to worry about is growing, growing and lettuce. Delivering. So the, the home base will be Ames. Yeah. You'll yep. uh, eventually when you get more of these locations scaled out, farms scaled out, Ames will be kind of become the hub. Yeah. And then the yeah. rest will take over as just growing that multiplication. Yeah. 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 And it, the the way we want to do too is we want to leapfrog. So, you know, we want to go from uh from a- an Ames farm to, you know, a, a reachable market within Ames. It's it doesn't sound like it is for some people, but Minneapolis is only 3 hours away. Right. Mm-hmm. And Kansas City, for example, too, it's it's right in the middle, you know, yep. you're only 3 hours away from both those places. So, yep one farm could supply that market. You know, yep. you get a certain to start off, you know, to either, uh, it's called a soft launch. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm-hmm. Um, just it's a, it's a soft launch into a new market right? where you don't have to spend any resources. You're just delivering from the Ames farm or yep. say we launch a farm in Cedar Rapids or yep. Iowa city, you know, then you can go to Davenport, you go yep. to Moline, you right? Yep. That you just, and then you, set up a farm in Moline, go to Chicago or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, yep. so it's, that, yeah. And so you basically build upon your existing customer base yep. and then branch out from right. that yep. base. One location. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it's an effective way to do it. And it's not, you know, over leverage yourself, you know, you keep it pretty exactly. simple and safe. So, you don't. people are kind of close, you know, if something yep. shit hits the fan, you can drive up. You yep, can right. fix something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Spend, spend a day or whatever. Yeah. It's not mm-hmm. like it's, you know, some of the investors were like, um, we should go to California. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Because, because that's where a lot of such a huge market because, well, it, it is, you can, you can, you can, cha- you can charge a lot for your lettuce there, but rent would be crazy. Then if something's wrong. You can't then, just drive an hour and exactly. be Exactly. From there out, where do you go? Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, that that's like that's kind of overstepping, like overleaping, yeah. in yeah. my opinion. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, yeah. let's walk sh- before you, to, yeah, yeah, walk before you run, yeah, yeah, for sure. So Nebulum's trying to go nationwide with this this thing. They're trying to go across the whole United States. Yes, that's the mission. Eventually, the mission is to have the company acquired. Yes, that's what that's what it sound like. Uh, is there much competition here in Iowa as far as vertical farming? Or are you guys really? I think we're the only vertical Soul farm source. in Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple other indoor farms um, that, you know, they'll, they'll sell, but they sell mostly to restaurants. Yep. They're doing the wholesale gr- model. They're doing the wholesale. Um, you know, they don't stack their, their lettuce. They don't stack their lettuce, so they're not using their space, uh, their full space. And So you guys so, feel like you're really ahead of everybody here. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think uh, you're doing the best you can. I think, yeah. yeah. I think the way that this is set up is um, it makes the most sense. So, yeah. do you 
you just think like when you go build these new locations, like we talked about the contract growing thing, do you feel like that's going to be the model or do you feel like we're going to hire employees for this specific farm and they're just going to focus on growing the lettuce? Or you're going to you, own the facilities. You're going to, yeah. Think, I think we'll rent the facilities. So you'll most likely. So, you'll rent space and then build it out as you want it. Yeah. So like ideally it, it'd be a place that's um, just kind of an underserved space or underutilized space rather yep. not underserved, but underutilized space. So uh, the space that we have uh, our Ames farm in was just uh, an old lab. So yep. there's just like, okay, it was hooked up with utilities and, you know, just yep. a big open space. So let's use it. And it was just sitting empty for a while. Um, so start using that space. And then, you know, that's another thing is to find space that is not used so that it could potentially be cheaper. So when you, when you sit down and you think about the long term, like what, what's next for you? What do you see yourself, you know, five or 10 years down the road? Um, so at first I want to focus, focus more, uh, my time on this company and, uh, getting, helping this company scale and, um, basically kind of go either up in flames or kind of ride it till it, yeah, just ride it till the wheels fall off. So, um, do that until, until things either happen or don't happen. Um, and then we'll see what happens, but, um, I, I want to get in back into insect farming eventually yep. for sure. Um, and then I just hope to be surrounded by people that are smarter than myself, yep. which is I try to do that a lot of times. And it's worked out well so far. So you can't beat that. You don't want to be. Yeah, they always say you want to hang out with people that are higher level than you are, because then it brings bit, you up a little bit smarter than yeah, you are. Yeah, definitely yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's harder for you than it is for me. I can <laughs> I can find smart people really easy. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> me too. we really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us. It, you know, these are the kind of conversations that um, I think people enjoy because it kind of opens your eyes. There's so much out there that's going on that you don't you even know, know about. Well, eventually you do. Eventually you hear about, you know, something like that. And you're like, oh, well, how, you know, how did that start or where did that come from? And there's just a lot of innovation out there. There's a lot of people trying to solve the problems that we got. And, you know, um, a lot of pioneers. Yeah. A lot of industries, a lot of places. There's just a lot of opportunity, just like your uh, professor showed you. Yeah, I think that's super cool that he did that, showing you the stats. Just like, what are you guys going to do about it? Yeah, it just yeah, it just kind of opened opened our eyes, and yeah, there is there is money to be made everywhere. And just think of if you if you think of want to think of a business idea, just think of a problem that you have in your life, and then think of a solution to that problem. And there's probably yeah. you're probably not the only one who's dealing with that problem. But you don't have to be the only one to make make a living at it. That's the thing that people I think get caught up on. Well, there's this out here. You know, there's this thing and this thing. There's this company out there, so I can't. Yeah, not everybody is trying to solve that problem or is the best at it. And right. not they'll not all not all those people be successful long term. Where can people find you? Where can people find you? Where do you want them to go so they can follow you and learn more? See this journey and learn more. Uh, so for the lettuce uh, subscriptions, uh, you can sign up at eatlettuce.com uh, if you're in Cedar Rapids or Iowa City or uh, Ames or Des Moines, of course. Um, and then it's Huey Be Cool on TikTok and uh, Huey Bullen. So it's H-U-E-Y B-O-E-L-E-N on YouTube. Um, and then that that's that's actually my same, that's actually the name on my Instagram. YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Yep. Um, which I don't do too much on, Insta or on Twitter or Instagram really, but I've been posting a little bit more on YouTube. Um, a lot of my TikToks and stuff I'm posting on YouTube and yep. might as well those. get some traction on there too. Yep. You heard the man. Go follow him. We really appreciate coming on the show, Huey. Thank you very much. And we'll see you guys back here next Friday for an awesome episode. Uh -huh.